Shara um, got a nice uh, meeting for us. I think at this point, it's going to be uh, largely uh, informational with a few things to talk about. But as usual, I'd like to go around and hear what everybody's up to. And I'll and even I'll start because uh, I just got back. I was two weeks on the island of Roatan off the coast of Honduras. 78 to 82 degrees every day. When I came back, it was 15 degrees. <laughs> oh, man. So I had, I had a really great couple of weeks, but uh, I'm back now and getting back in the swing of being around the Klamath. And as I stated, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on down here. So I'm glad OWEB stepped up. So Marat, what's going on with you? <clears throat> Well, I've been planning our summer camping trips because you have to sign up really, really early to get a campsite with a little trailer. And so we've been trying to find places to go and then sort of plot road trips. So doing the things that, you know, new retirees do. Well, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Where, where are you staying in Oregon? Or are you going? Uh, both. We're in, trying to find places on the Deschutes. Hosmer Lake's a famous favorite place to go kayaking, and Rod loves to fish there. And then Cottonwood on the John Day. I'd never been there. He's been. We're going to go there. And then the Southwest a little bit, trying to stay out of, the Coda, you know, places like Kodachrome and everything are just booked solid already. It's kind of amazing, just months and months ahead of time. Outdoor recreation is popular now. Yes, it is. Liza Jane. How's everything in your neck of the woods? <clears throat> it's good. I, I think I told you all like the after the last meeting, I was headed to Mexico the next day. Uh, really awesome. The gray whales down in the Baja were just like exploding and dancing. I just, I was a shrieking fool on the beach for a week and got to let go of some baby turtles, do that thing for the first time and um, just had a great, a great trip and I'm heading back there in three weeks. I really enjoyed myself. So that's good. But I came home, Mark, um, Carl, like you to sub zero and um, started lambing. So I've had little adorable lambs uh, jumping around my living room and um, lucky they have wool coats, but it's been a little intense and, and fun. Sounds like fun all the way around. Glad you had a great experience in Mexico. That sounds cool. Thank you. Mark Labhart, besides wheeling and dealing, what have you been doing? Um, well, I'm just looking forward. Um, in about two weeks, right after the ODIF and W Commission meeting, uh, we're heading for Disney World. Our, our daughter works for Disney, so <clears throat> we're taking the grandkids to Florida to uh, get the five-year-old. This will be his first trip to Disney World, so... Uh, We'll be joining the crowds down there and I'll be sitting on the bench watching everybody <laughs> drinking a pop. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not real good at going around the tilt the worlds very fast. So uh, I'll sit and watch and uh, take pictures. So in a couple of weeks. Heading I, went, I went to high school in Lakeland, Florida, and we would go to Disney World all the time. And we would get on that big gondola that's that. Uh, elevated gondola i won't tell you what we did while we we're on the gondola but we had, <laughs> we had a lot of fun in disney world well, it should be fun <laughs> kelly all right can everybody hear me yeah. yeah great cool um i actually drove past the klamath on my way to mount shasta this weekend i had my birthday on saturday and the snow was perfect for Shasta. So me and my family went down and uh, skied with everybody. And my five-year-old went from the leash to skiing blue runs in one day. So it was epic. We all skied all the blues together. The whole family is kind of like a little family dream that one day we'd all be skiing down together on the same, on the same place. So it was super fantastic and some fresh powder on Friday and no waiting lines. So we just would ski right back on, come back to that, ski right back on, come right back down. So it was a gorgeous weekend and came back to beautiful coastal weather here. It's, you know, sexy and gorgeous and sunny and 
I'm happy. Well, Kelly, congratulations on your 22nd birthday. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Did I make Double points there? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> You're close. Double, double that. You're, you're getting closer. <laughs> did you get to do the Gray Butte lift? We, I did. Uh, let's see here. Actually, no, I didn't. We didn't do that one. That was the far off. We did Douglas. I did Douglas and Coyote. The kids stayed on Marmot. Um, and Matt did not go up on Gray Butte that day either. So we didn't hit that one. It seems like it's hard to get to. It's really hard to get to, but it's great. <laughs> great terrain. Oh, cool. It, it just opened. So. Oh, next time. Mauricio. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Glad to be here. I, like you, I'm just having this wanderlust. It's been a while since I've done, done the traveling and, you know, after the Netherlands and Spain. It's something about coming back to familiar territory that is both sort of like bittersweet. And so my family and I have been trying to apply this sort of like travel lens to our you know, the spaces in which we're in. Like, it seems when you travel, you sort of like create an agenda of all the things that you could see. And that's something that you could also do at home. And so we mean sort of like, like if, if I was a tourist here in my home, what would that look like? And it's been work, working wonders. I definitely looking forward now that I'm finishing my scuba certification to go and visit Carl's uh, place in Roatan. So we'll discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, and very much looking forward to the mountain. I the last time I went snowboarding, I broke my elbow, so I'm hoping I'm gonna have a little bit more luck this time around. Glad to be here. Hello, everybody. Stern. <clears throat> hey there. Nice to see everybody this afternoon. Uh, we've been uh, out hiking and birding locally. It's always fun to see what you can uh, dig up since the first of the year and where things are. A little bit of skiing in Central Oregon where it was very cold. It was below zero a couple mornings. So that was eye-opening, so to speak. And also participated last week in the first meeting of the Oregon Private Forest Accord meeting where we met in Salem with the six other board members and Sarah. Uh, Charlotte was there for a little while. Davia was there as well as others. So I think that so it seems like a good group of people. Uh, it's structured a little bit like the OWEB board. So there's also five uh, state and federal agencies who are ex officio there, including Chris Allen from OWEB, a board representing Fish and Wildlife Service. So it seems like a good group, uh, kind of like the startup of OCRF, uh, a lot of legwork to kind of figure out how it's going to work exactly, but people are pretty enthusiastic. Um, some of the people wanted to get money out the door the first two months and Sarah and Andy, the program manager, had to politely and carefully explain why that's a great idea, but it probably wouldn't happen that quick. So, oh, well, Mark, and to get that money out the door quickly, and, and we'll talk about that later but anyway we did have some conversations that maybe implicate uh ocrf a little bit in that venue but that was a, a little bit in the to be determined category well, that sounds like a brilliant idea to me um all right kaylin good afternoon everyone um it sounds like mark and i were skiing in the same place in the same weather weekend before last Although I saw two degrees when I got back to my vehicle. Um, so yeah, toasty. But uh, yeah, just hosting hosting folks here and, and lots of time uh, in the backcountry, enjoying, enjoying winter, which is uh, what I love to do. And looking forward to visiting uh, Anthony Lakes and a little Eastern Oregon a few weeks from now, um, which is uh, one of my favorite places. So otherwise, uh, just lots of legislative session work and um, sort of coming to the close of a biennium and uh, helping around a, a variety of different advisory councils, lots on the work world, um, but enough skiing to keep a good balance in life, so. Palin, are you skiing in the back country? Is that what you're doing? For the most part, yep, yep. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been great, enjoying winter. Um, I hope that, uh, <laughs> 
Whatever Punk and Tony Phil said is he just continues to be wrong. Apparently, the groundhog is wrong more than he's right. So more winter for me. More precept. Oh, yeah. You can use the precept. That's for we sure. Certain, certainly can. And I, I echo the enthusiasm around uh, around the Klamath River work as we've talked about in the past. Um, I'm excited to go down there this spring as well. Oh, if you're heading, oh, please uh, let me know if you're heading down here. I'd love to get get with you. And, show you some things. I would love that. That goes for any of y'all. Klamath is a little bit out of the way, but you go through on the way to Shasta. So let me know. Let me know uh, if you're coming through. I'd love. <clears throat> Jane, we missed you last time. Glad you were able to join us. Well, I am too. I read the minutes, so I'm up to date. But um, yeah, I just got back from Costa Rica, so I got to be in a warm place too. That's really super nice there. I was up in the cloud forest, which is my happy place. And uh, another news, the nursery is starting to get really busy again, which is kind of fun. But the best news is we're getting a new puppy. So maybe on the next meeting, I'll have to hold the puppy up. So it's a Border Collie uh, Aussie Shepherd mix, um, which is what our, our uh, dog that died last summer was. And so we're super excited about having a little fuzz ball in our life. Oh, well, that's great. I mean, that dogs are a real pain, but boy, it would be <laughs> almost un, unthinkable to live without them. <laughs> Charlotte, how have you been? As if I didn't know. Hi, everyone. I've been great. Um, I might be one of the few people on this call that is enjoying the beginning of spring. I wrote a tilled one of my three enormous garden beds got my gooseberries and my blueberries and my elderberries all planted. So I'm kind of looking forward to the next one this uh, weekend. We're going to till up the next one, get some more onions and garlic in the ground. So knock on wood, they don't freeze off too badly, but I think we got some good weather coming. That great example of, of the diversity of Oregon. You're in your garden and my garden's still frozen. I couldn't put a shovel in it if I wanted to. <laughs> my rhubarb is sprouting just to give you perspective so okay. and we divided it already <laughs> yeah we got another month before we can even think about it oh well <clears throat> well great well thank you all for being here it's great to hear how everybody's doing again it, hearing the stories from all across the state it just reiterates what an incredible state we live in and and how many fantastic things there are to do and i just reiterate how fortunate I am to be able to serve on a committee like this to try to make it even better. So thank you all for participating. So did, did you want to introduce the public, Charlotte? Is that the time we do that? Uh, yep. So next up, I'm not going to introduce the public. We have a couple people kind of popping in and out. I would like to just say thank you all of the public for joining us today. Uh, so you've joined into the Oregon Conservation Recreation Fund Advisory Committee. We meet monthly. Um, and for basic kind of online etiquette, because I see a bunch of new faces here, uh, we do have a public comment period. We welcome you to um, share your thoughts and any sort of comments you would like then. And also during the meeting, if you have any thoughts you want to interject, you're welcome to join in the chat. So I think with that, I have recorded the ones that I've seen, but there's a few of you kind of popping in and out. Um, but with that, Carl, let's go to the agenda item one, and I am going to share my screen to review and approve meeting minutes. So <clears throat> we, <clears throat> Jane read all the meeting minutes, and so uh, we have those up for approval. Can we get a motion? Happy to do that. And I'll second it. I Great. move to approve. Uh, do, do we need to read it, or do we already? Yes, please. No, okay. no, go ahead and read it. I move to approve the January sixth, twenty twenty three meeting minutes with a continued authority to correct spelling, grammar, and punctuation. And we have a sec. All second, Liza Jane. Jane, all in favor? Thank you, Charlotte. Thanks for putting those together. <clears throat> Jane, is there anything that you really didn't like about what we did? Oh, Jane's on mute. It looked good. Okay, great. 
All right, so um, the next agenda is the governor's budget. Charlotte, do you want to you want to give that overview? Uh, yep. So I'm going to give that overview, and we also have uh, Sarah Wright with us today. So Sarah, I might actually ask you if you're willing to also just uh, turn your camera on and or unmute, so we can kind of tag team this together. You bet. So the governor's budget is pretty much the update's pretty high level. So the governor's budget came out. Uh, last week now, and that was right before February 1st, as kind of required by law. And the governor's budget really is the budget starting place for where the legislature will be picking up. And this is where us as agency individuals, so myself and Sarah, in addition to all of you as board members, this is kind of the budget that we have to work with. Uh, as kind of this document was very, very long, I did provide you a link of the formal budget below. Um, the department has provided out a overview kind of synthesis of what does this budget mean for ODFW, and that is a document that I did provide with you. So kind of the high level kind of overview for what's important here is that there was a series of policy option packages that were put forward by the department and specifically one that was for the Oregon Conservation Recreation Fund. This included two parts, one to fund the staff position, the coordinator that um, position that I sit in, and then also kind of the second part of that same pot was $3 million of general fund ask for operating of the grant program. So when the governor's budget came out, you can see that the policy option package for the OCRF was partially accepted. That's what the little star asterisk meant. And really what um, occurred is that the position uh, was funded, but the secondary funding for the $3 million uh, was not part of that package. So this is where really the department has moving forward. And as department and state agency personnel, this is really kind of the budget that we work with and that we really do not advocate outside of. So I'm gonna pass it to Sarah to give any sort of additional perspective and kind of thoughts of explanations. Well, Charlotte, I think you did a really excellent job. I'm not sure that I have much to contribute beyond that other than just to say uh, that there's probably more questions than there are answers at my level right now as our director's office and our, our, our budget department within the director's office it, are the ones that are combing through the actual details to know some of the more specifics. Um, I can tell you that the position was um, uh, made permanent in the governor's recommended budget. So that's one hurdle, if you all recall, this position has been operating as a limited duration, kind of on repeat through the last couple of biennia, and this would make it permanent. Um, and beyond that, um, I'm still waiting on quite a bit of detail in terms of um, uh, just some more specifics about the budget. But this is, this is what I know, and I guess it's probably just best to see if any of you all have any questions that we can try and answer. Well, Sarah, <clears throat> I do have a couple of questions, and you're probably not uh, at a position to answer them. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that um, I noted is that Charlotte's position, and by the way, we're absolutely thrilled, and thank we thank the department for asking for that as part of the POP, and to get her on permanently, that's really a big deal for us. Uh, but I noted that it's it's funded with quote other funds mm -hmm. and wondered what that meant. So here's what I think it means. And I, I do have an email into Deputy Director Shannon Hearn for confirmation that I'm correct. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I think it means. And if I have to circle back with a correction, then, then I'll, I'll do that. Uh, but with, with the way the OCRF fund works, uh, funds that are deposited, general funds or any funds that are deposited into the OCRF account become other funds, which essentially means they're, they're obligated or dedicated funds that cannot, they don't revert then at the end of the biennium. And so what I, when I see that other fund, what, what that means to me is that it's, <clears throat> it's coming from the OCRF account to pay for the position and therefore it's not considered general fund anymore. 
Um, Charlotte was was anticipating this question and wondering if that would in some way be related to Fishhawk Lake funds. And I don't believe it would because those are not with the department. Those are those are held outside the agency. So does that imply that there's going to be a general fund deposit to the OCRF to cover that? And so far as the position is concerned, that's what I take that to mean. But like right. I said, I'm waiting for, for Shannon to confirm that. And yeah, it is, um, you know, I, 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 share the, I share the bummer in that the, uh, the 3 million requests didn't make it in there too. I know you all are aware of some of the um, legislative bills that are in play that would bring other different potential funding sources to OCRF. And so, um, we'll, you know, we'll see how those play out. And of course, those drought funds that, that we received in the, the uh, short session are, are carrying forward in the next final as well. Well, thank you, Sarah. That that's an encouraging thing. I understand that the final answer is there. I have one more question, and then we can have Mark put his hand up. Um, there are <laughs> there was everybody's putting their hand up. So the pop, the the Charlotte's request was part of the same pop, and <clears throat> the fact that the pop survived but the funding didn't, I've been told might uh provide an avenue to have it reinstated without going against the governor's budget if if uh that was just something that was brought up by someone who knows the ins and outs of state government and so i was just curious if you had opportunity um i think you know at this point Anything is possible if stakeholders were able to work with legislators to bring it forward to, to bring, you know, because now at this point, the, the legislature takes a look at the governor's recommended budget and things change from here yet again. So that would be stakeholders that would need to, to be bringing that forward and advocating for that. Um, it's always at the governor's discretion to sort of either accept pops wholesale or to just accept parts of policy option packages. So that's always the way that works. And I, from here, yeah, I mean, it's possible that they would, um, it's possible that that'll come forward in terms of what gets integrated into the legislatives, legislatively adopted budget and or it comes forward as part of a bill. It's hard to say at this point, and it would be, that would be stakeholder driven and just underlining Charlotte's reminder about our role, your role as advisory committee members in that that you're limited from lobbying. Um, you know, need to be wearing another hat outside of your advisory committee if you're working on any advocacy for funding for OCRF. Charlotte has been extremely clear about that and, and uh, we appreciate yeah. her persistence in making sure we know. Uh, Mark, I, you had your hand up. <clears throat> yeah, sir. I was just, you mentioned that Charlotte's position or the coordinator's position is, you know, is now permanent. And I guess I, just to clarify, what does that mean for the next biennium? Does that mean that it's automatically rolled within a general fund request by ODF and W or? Right. So beginning next biennium, it becomes permanent. And what that means is that it gets included in our base program budget. So it's not something that we have to request as part of a policy option package going forward. And so does that assume then that the general funding would come with it? it you know, if the department's budget base budget was approved, that that general funding would include this coordinator position. That's the part I'm looking to confirm with the director's office. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Jane, you have your hand up. <clears throat> Uh, you're on mute. Can you explain to us what the uh, consequences are if this $3 million doesn't get funded? And we're operating off of the, the existing funds that are in the, um, in the account. And I can maybe give a little bit more clarity on what the existing kind of status quo is, just so that everyone's aware. So we currently within our coffers have about $3.5 million. How that is going to be kind of looking out uh, 
through the end of this biennium and into the next is that you currently have an RFP that is out kind of on the streets. The goal was to do a status quo of about $1 million in that RFP. Those decisions for funding, how much you would want to be funding, would happen at the end of May of this year. So you still have a little bit of time to kind of adjust what you would do in that RFP. Moving forward, that would leave you roughly about $2.5 million within the OCRF coffers, those other funds that Sarah described, to continue for the next um, full biennium, which is two years. And that is roughly, if you stayed status quo, um, you would have to adjust down what you've been granting probably to about $700,000 to keep the four grant cycles going. There would be obviously some consideration if you want to condense it to one a year, or if you would continue with the four, if you would condense down the size of your grants and how you would kind of position within there. There also is the fish off lake settlement money, which is another $800,000 that could be utilized for a wide range of different purposes, um, coordinating with the department. So that's kind of- They basically unfunded us for the future, the whole thing. I mean, we have what we've got left and that's it as far as they're concerned right now. Um, I would maybe phrase it as they didn't unfund us, they just didn't fund us. I mean, at this point, OCRF has been a little bit scrappy as it is, and you have been opportunistically receiving funds. And there are some other opportunistic ways, as mentioned, through different stakeholder-driven legislative bills, partnerships with other funding organizations, including Portland Harbor, our continuation of private donations, especially through ELS. Um, I'm not disagreeing with you, Jane, but I'm maybe just spinning it a little bit. <laughs> in, in dire. In it really sounds in, dire. In Charlotte's innumerable way, she is spinning it in a way, but I wouldn't spin it at all. And I'd say it exactly like you did, Jane. So, but I'll, I'll defer to Charlotte on that. I, I, I want to I think this is an opportune time to point something out. We have a couple of members in the audience. I saw someone from TNC, someone from Trout Unlimited, and uh, I'm not sure if Oregon Hunters Association was part of this negotiation or not, but our drought fund, uh, which of course we were extremely happy with, without that, we would be looking at zero this coming biennium. And so I just wanted to reiterate to uh, the TNC and Trout Unlimited and anyone else that was involved in that, uh, I think the Wild Salmon Center might have been as well, 100% uh, gratitude for that. And that's what's allowing us to keep going without losing too much momentum. Uh, we have have tremendous momentum. And if we'd have gotten that 3 million, it would have really kept that going. And not to jump ahead too much, but just so everyone knows, there are maybe some other opportunities that we'll discuss uh, a little bit later. So anyway, thanks to those groups helped get us that funding and we really appreciate it. So are there any other questions for Sarah or Charlotte regarding the way the governor's budget came out? I, I'll, I'll also give some color to that in that uh, the governor has very distinct priorities this biennium. Um, and has voiced that and said it over and over again. There were multiple ODF and W pops, some things that were uh, very near and dear to the department's heart <laughs> that did not get funded. So we're not <laughs> alone. Um, <laughs> not that should make us feel any better, but um, Mark may be able to give us some color on all of this. Well, um, it, as you all know, this program is near and dear to me um, pretty strongly. And so um, as public officials, we need to be really careful. So I'll say that right up front. <clears throat> but when a, you know, I'll, this is my opinion now, but when a POP is in, included in the governor's budget, that means that the agency can lobby for that POP. Now, the question that I have for Shannon is, okay, does that mean we can only lobby for Charlotte's position? Because the governor proposes, but the legislature disposes. So that's just the starting point. So don't panic here. 
about OCRF because it's all in the legislature's hands for the final disposition of the budget. This is just the starting point. And so uh, this program has a huge amount of support from our stakeholder groups. And on March 15th is when the budget for ODF&W goes before what they call the Subcommittee of Ways and Means of Natural Resources. And so there will be an opportunity for groups of people, uh, stakeholder groups, individuals, uh, to lobby the legislature to establish the funding for the OCRF. And that includes the POP and it includes the funding that was uh, we don't have right now. And so that will be the opportunity, in my opinion, to for folks to come in and uh, stakeholder groups to lobby for that. And I can guarantee you uh, those conversations I've had with some folks that they're lining up to do that. And so um, you can lobby as an individual, but you can't lobby as a uh, public official but you can identify yourself as an individual. But I do know um, Representative Helm is definitely aware of this because uh, he was our uh, champion in the last legislative session with some of the work that he did. So he's definitely aware of where the pop is right now. And so I, I, I'm more of an optimist than maybe some out there, right? Even though uh, the department suffered quite a, a reaction to a number of POPs that had general fund in it, i.e. tax dollars, got cut from the ODF&W budget. And so there's going to be some uh, positions. Uh, the department has to deal with some of this stuff that's going on with the general fund portion of it. But um, I hope that we um, can confirm um, with Shannon, um, you know, the process and all that as we move through there. But I believe that there's going to be a strong support when the budget comes up where the legislature says we want to hear from the public about the department's budget, there will be strong support to continue this program. And the legislature has in the past, yeah, as you've seen, you know, they said, well, we'll just give it to OCRF because they do a good job. So I'm a little more optimistic than maybe some folks ever. So thanks. Well, Mark, having you there uh, makes me a lot more optimistic. So I appreciate everything that you do for us. Uh, it's, you, you've really been instrumental all the way through. Kaylin, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to maybe follow on briefly as additional context um, from another natural resource agency, the Parks and Recreation Department budget also saw some POPs go through wholesale, some completely removed and, and some modified. And our department budget is um, the first up for a full hearing this week. And while that doesn't have a direct connection, obviously, to the OCRF program, we'll have a chance to, to see how that subcommittee handles a budget, what sort of questions or themes might come up. And so it's just a, a learning opportunity. I'll certainly be paying attention there. And, um, you know, I, I, not to suggest that there's anything more than, than that. It's just the first one through. So we'll see what we learn and, and how those discussions go this week. So just wanted to let folks know that. Yeah, Kayla, we'd really be interested to hear your experience with that. Thank you. Yep. I, I also would take this time just to point out that we have a really compelling story. I did I last uh, legislative session, and I ended up testifying, uh, talking to congressmen, senators, but uh, it was in a very informational role. We uh, apparently were able to provide information, not lobby, but we have some really compelling information, and we just have to put that together. The tens of thousands of individual donors that we have, the, the, the fact that we raised $1.5 million in private funds, those are the kind of things that will get the legislators' attention, and, and those are facts and information that we can convey to them. So we we just have to, Charlotte, maybe we, you and I should be thinking about a way to provide and, you know, get an informational sort of package that all of us could use to uh, let our congressmen and folks know what we've achieved thus far. So... Back yeah, and I might just add into there. Um, there is definitely 
um, we're in kind of a waiting phase to figure out what's going on. Um, I would highly encourage the individuals on this call, do not kind of sign up for anything testimonial and or um, hearings or anything until you coordinate with the department. The department has a strategy that we wanna make sure that we're unified with and we need to be very careful about that. How do we provide information without providing bias since we are state officials? But that said, um, our coalition and the individuals on this call past the board are our strongest advocates. And we will be kind of working through later in this meeting, kind of the one page informational. If we want to hand our coalition some information to say, if you want to share, this is what we're about this year, and this is what we've been about, that's really our strongest way. And then letting stakeholders take that information and run with it. Um, but definitely lots of coordination. I think the next two weeks are going to be as busy as the last two weeks. So, Charlotte mentioned our coalition, and we'll definitely depend on that. Sristi, who's not here, could have also given us quite a bit of insight. She's a registered lobbyist and knows how to navigate that. If uh, any of you have some desire to do something, you might run it by Sristi as well and see what's the most effective way for you to be utilized in, in that regard. And always see me, please, just as a reminder. Um, so I think with that, I feel our conversation's wrapping up a little bit. Um, Carl, would it, do you want to kind of see if anyone else has any other thoughts or questions? And then if Sarah, you have any other kind of department guidance for us? Um, I, I do, Charlotte, the, there are a few things that are out there that apparently we can talk about with um, having to do like Rep Helms bills, are we do we have a time for that discussion or is that um so that's kind of no and i would say that really what i would recommend is that there are many bills that are out there in different stages of kind of um being written and also um ongoing hearings the easiest thing would be really for um if people are interested in kind of where we're at uh, Sarah, I don't know if we can just kind of give them a list and say, hey, this is what's occurring. Um, there is obviously a fine line of making sure we track things, but not advocate on the behalf of any of the bills since those were not in the governor's budget. Right. So, so again, just I think it would make everyone nothing else to know what was going on. You're not able to go and advocate as a member of the Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund for any of these. But as I'm learning what a crazy uh, system this is because there's a hearing on one of the bills that may significantly impact us this Thursday. So that's why I think it's important for people to know what's out there and, and just be extremely careful in terms of acting on any of the information. But I think, yeah, it's I worth think that's, that's perfectly reasonable, Carl. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think I've got the bill numbers in front of me that um, we can talk about those briefly just so that you all are aware um, and can be tracking. I believe um, one is 2999. Yeah, 2999, House Bill 2999 is one of those. And um, that is the one that is related to wildlife connectivity and implementation of the uh, wildlife action plan. And there is, uh, OCRF is mentioned as one of the, the tools for implementation uh, in that bill. So that's one worth reading about. And as Carl said, it, it sounds like it's gonna have a hearing on Thursday. And then the other one is House Bill 2835, I believe. If I have that number right, Charlotte, kind of looking at you. Um, and that one relates to providing urban fishing opportunities and has um, funds that would go to OCRF to uh, help implement and provide those opportunities, actually quite similar to how ODFW's uh, um, R&E funds, our R&E program, restoration and enhancement program already works. So that's another one worth uh, reading about and tracking. Those are the two that I'm following at the moment. And I might um, add on, Sarah, just to be clear. So those are the two that um, kind of have been flushed out and that clearly identify the OCRF. 
Uh, to be clear, 2999 has funds associated with it. The urban fishing does not. It has a directive for the department to act in a priority area, but no associated um, expenditures or allocations with it. Yeah, but that would be just the one clarification. There is a third bill that currently just has, uh, it's a placeholder, it's a, it, there's a placeholder. It's a water related drought bill and the OCRF is potentially going to be uh, named as a uh, entity and as well as an allocation of funding. And I don't recall the number of that one. It's got 3124 in it, but I don't know the order. One, two, three, well, four. At this point, that bill has not been flushed out. As you mentioned, it is a placeholder. So um, I would be hesitant to kind of have too much of a conversation here about that until that comes to light. But that is definitely, um, and I'm happy to give everyone the link. Um, we have the ability as private citizens to always go to the website and kind of look and see what bills are popping and what um, is actually being listed with the OCR app. So that's gonna be a little bit of a wait and see to see what happens on that one. So it's good for everybody to know that there's some activity out there and the session is a, a long process. and. So don't despair uh, as of yet. And even if the worst comes to worst, we'll get through it. And then with the new, with the governor in place, that would give the opportunity to really set the stage for a more sort of approach to how we're funded. So, okay. So uh, any, any other questions now that we mentioned that? And if not, we can move on. Okay, Charlotte, you want to move on? Uh, Sarah, thank, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to do that and uh, appreciate everything that you're doing for us. And Yeah, um, absolutely. We'll, we'll continue to keep OCRF as a high priority in all the conversations we're having as well. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, Charlotte, you want to talk about the communications committee? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to talk about communications kind of um, a little bit of, I guess, a spattering of different things that we're working on. And I also do want to end on, um, we're in a better position today even than we were one year ago when I started. So I would still say that. So I think we, although it's a little disappointing, we have good momentum. And maybe with these communications, as we continue to tell our story and enhance what is our outward vision and what are we about, that would actually help us move forward. So with that, I'm going to share my screen if I can. Hang on, I have the wrong PowerPoint up. You can bear with me for just a second. So I think what I would like to start, there it is. Apologies, I have lots of things on my screen. Okay. Can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, awesome. So yeah, so the first thing I wanna start out with is that we, at our last meeting, we talked about kind of re-energizing our OCRF coalition. And particularly one of the ways that we wanted to do this was um, to send out an email update of kind of where we were at with the OCRF, with current funding and with um, policy option packages. So Sarah sent out that email to our entire coalition about two weeks ago, and we've gotten some really great feedback back from many of our coalition members kind of thanking us for that and kind of 
giving us that renewed um, interest in making sure that we continue to do that. So Sarah and I in the department will be continuing to use our Gov delivery system to kind of send quarterly updates to our coalition members, just as short letters, um, kind of highlighting what have we done, what are the different projects we're working on. So that's one of the kind of new things since the last time we met that we're going to be doing for coalition um, outreach and communication. In addition, since we last met along similar lines to coalition, um, we sent out an update to all of our donors through our e that have donated on our ELS system. So I sent out an email with a very kind of brief, thank you for donating to the OSTRF. This is what OSTRF does, and this is where your dollars went. And that email went to 9,000 individuals. So that is all of the people who donated to the OSTRF last year alone. So that was very exciting. And we actually have gotten a couple of phone calls um, I'll actually apologize. Uh, Davia got a couple phone calls because the phone number wasn't updated on the signature, but Davia said she got some great feedback from our email and that people were really excited that um, they got the email and they got to see where some of their dollars went. And I think hopefully some of you guys saw that. I, I saw that, Charlotte. And I, as I mentioned to you, uh, it was great. It was awesome. It was just right. Perfect message. And uh, hopefully a lot of the folks that received it took a look at it because it really laid out the case for the OCRF very well. I hope yeah. I hope all of you got it because then that meant you donated to the OCRF. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least through uh, the ODFW page. Through the ODFW. Um, but yeah, no, we had good opening rates. So that system, I'm actually able to go in and see who opened them. And we had about a 30% open rate, which isn't terrible when you kind of have to think it's a little bit of a spam in some aspects if you haven't actually seen a Gov delivery email before. So um, I think that moving forward, we can do that um, maybe twice a year. Similar, if you remember, our kind of our funding um, graphics that I do from the ELS, we have two peaks of when we tend to get funding. We usually get it in January and we get it in around June. So we might be able to send out another similar email around June, reminding people during that peak of when they tend to donate, um, what are their dollars going towards? Just as another easy way to kind of remind people of who we are and what we're up to. So in addition, we also had um, a communication subgroup uh, meeting on January 30th. Uh, we had Marisha and Tristy there with us, in addition to our partners in the coalition from Trout Unlimited, uh, the Oregon Zoo, many of our ODFW communications team, um, and also Forest Park Conservancy was there. It was a mixture of uh, department staff, obviously advisory committee members, uh, coalition members, Oregon Wildlife Foundation was there also, um, but also our recipients. And we had a great kind of conversation about where we want to move forward. What do we want to do? How do we talk about the OCRF? And there was some kind of definitely huge range of work that we want to do. But the first thing that kind of came up was this interest in um, putting out the Nature of Oregon Day proclamation again. So as a reminder, I did send out this document to the group. And really the Nature of Oregon Day Proclamation was just a really amazing way of resonating what the OSRF is about and really what we are trying to do collectively. Uh, last year, we did have an April 7th event, kind of a gathering up in Portland. Um, we did kind of come to the decision that we're not sure if we're going to do one large gathering, but there's interest in doing something. So kind of stay tuned as the subcommittee kind of meets again. There will be meeting end of February, beginning of March, and really kind of trying to focus how do we get our message out and how do we get this proclamation resubmitted? So every year this will have to be resubmitted um, and we have to resubmit it to our new governor this year. And fingers crossed, we should still be on the right time frame that we will get this in and hopefully approved by April 7th. But I think at this point, I'd love to ask Marie Sho, since you were at the meeting, or Carl, you were there too, if you had any thoughts or reflections to share with the group. Um, not, sure. No, I mean, I feel that um, what the event meant uh, for me, certainly, and what I feel it was 
uh, the way in which it was perceived is just um, sort of like remind uh, all of us about that connection and uh, between conservation, recreation, the the multiplicity of interests that surround the um, the OCRF, and I feel that it would be um, it, it would be missed if we didn't find a way to just reclaim that sort of relevance within our community and certainly among the coalition, because the mission as it was then, as it is today, as it, when it was uh, first created remains the same. And I think it, just, it remains just as important. And so um, I feel that we we can uh, find more effective effective ways to, re, to be more active uh, now that, uh, we no longer are just in an exclusively fundraising effort, but more in a way of create awareness, make folks um, know that this is an opportunity. And also, uh, well, I mean, it can be both is what I'm saying. And so uh, since now the spirits is a little bit different, I think we probably can imagine clever ways to uh, bring that sense of awareness to who we are. And the proclamation still feels like a very adequate way to do so. Carl? Yeah, I agree with that. And I just want to point out to everyone that the uh, the name of this event, which I think is just brilliant, is uh, Mauricio came up with that. I just think it's a perfect way to state what we're trying to do and what the way Oregonians feel about their state. So I'm proud to be part of this. I th I think it's a good choice not to have an event that's putting too much on Charlotte's plate at this point, but I can see in the future potentially having an uh, event again, maybe next year, maybe it would be a biannual event, but trying to come up with a coherent plan to engage our coalition uh, and ways to mark the day and get in front of people what the OCRF does, I think is more or less the goal of what we're trying to do. I'd also like to say, that any of you that would like that feel like you've got something to add to that, we would love to have you join us. Uh, Charlotte is right now um, put sending out the whatever it's not a doodle poll, but some other way of getting people's times. Uh, let her know that you might like to participate because we'd love to have as much input as we can on that. Yeah, absolutely. And there is some kind of initial thoughts and I had quite a bit of kind of excitement of how do we highlight this, um, connect people with what we're about, connect people with nature, nature with people without just this huge single kind of planning event. And we have lots of ideas of trying to figure out how do you do, um, encourage videos, do potentially meetups, see if we can highlight our projects, see if a couple Maybe it's the nature of Oregon weekend and see if we can get a couple of our projects that happen to have things or field sites and invite the public to go visit. Um, I think there's a way of kind of getting to where we want to be without putting all the kind of eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Spread it out, spread the message. Um, Mark Stern. Yeah, I'm tracking what you're saying, and I realized that the amount of energy that went into pulling off that event last spring was large, and it sort of a lot of energy into one several-hour event. But I would also say that, you know, if there is another uh, Nature of Oregon Day proclamation this April, it would be a great opportunity to celebrate it in Salem on that day uh, with the obvious uh, benefit that the legislature would be there to see and feel part of that. So that might be maybe not quite the same form or fashion as last year, but something to think about. And there's scales to events. And I do have to say that this year it would be on a Friday, which I am much more willing. And um, <laughs> I will personally say, I know that's a longer commute for many of you, but Salem's very nice. And the fact that we have more staff support to assist. So I think nothing's off the table, but I would love to kind of think about how do we make the biggest impact for who we are and also really draw in our project participants and people like that. And I lost track of whose hand went up first. So I'll well, let you guys- I, I, Lisa, Lisa Jane went first. Yeah, but I'd like to uh, comment on that. I think that's a great idea, Mark. And as you, I think something could happen in that regard that is not gonna be logistically difficult. It's just like 
come to Salem and we're going to meet and march on the Capitol or something, but we're going to just get no. not march. Okay, not march on the Capitol. We're going to meet. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We have project participants in the Salem area, several of which, and I won't say it on a recording, have voiced their interest in inviting us to do site visits. So there yeah. might be an ability to highlight our projects more locally and do a meetup or a gathering at one of their locations. Um, that's always something we can explore, obviously, without putting someone on the spot. So that's why I'm not saying specific names. And Carl, no, you cannot give it any more party planning. All right. <laughs> Liza Jane. Ooh, okay. Um, I I am seeing this and thinking of all of Oregon and um, the importance um, of reminding Eastern Oregon, specifically my home, that we're part of um, part of the whole, and that it doesn't. Um, not all the focus is. This is Nature of Oregon Day for all of Oregon. So. Let's keep in front of us ways to include all of Oregon, not just uh, legislators and Salem, even though I understand why that occurs, but we could build out without too much extra work to make sure that all of Oregon's involved in this. I think it's a good opportunity if possible. That's a great point, Liza Jane. Thank you. Mauricio? Yes. So, and actually you set me up quite nicely, Liza Jane. I appreciate you. So what I was trying to, one of the things that I've, um, fail to mention and in terms of what I believe is another uh, important goal for our communications effort is that um, something that we didn't have before, which could, we, we were trying to be aspirational. We're trying to make an invitation. We're trying to tell the world what we wanted to do. But since then, we've been doing it. So we have stories of how the OCRF actually is reaching out all these communities, how this is an organ for everyone. And so one of the things that I'm hoping that we can do is to really showcase what that looks like in terms of OCRF and also be mindful about what our audiences are. The messages for those in the legislation world should be different than those of who maybe have not been invited to this conservation table yet and seeing themselves in some of the stories that we've helped create through our funding, I think is going to be an important piece of this. And, you know, again, I think everything's on the table. I think trying to be more mindful, trying to remember that just because we have OregonIsAlive.com, a website here, that we have these emails that go out, uh, you know, to certain, we are still, we have still a very limited lens. We still have a certain amount of people that oftentimes are already in this space that are learning about this. So I'm hoping that we can expand that to reach every corner of the state and to reach every community that probably are already doing the kind of work that we want to inspire, but do not see themselves as the kind of, you know, experts or worthy of funding for recreation and conservation. So I'm hoping that that is something that we can improve upon. And I think that we're primed to do so, especially now that we have stories to tell. And I have to say that you set me up, Mauricio, perfectly, because one of the next things I do want to at least highlight, and I think I cut you off, Carl, apologize, um, is I was, that... I was, I was going to say I, I agree with that, and the timing for us to revisit that whole uh, arena that kind of coincides nicely with the timing of the Nature of Oregon Day. So thanks, Mauricio. Perfect. So along actually both of those lines. So I um, am currently working with Adam Baylor, who is um, Habitat Division's kind of um, education outreach person here at the department. And we've actually met last week to kind of start figuring out how do we start gathering um, visual imagery to start amplifying our stories, our verbal and our spoken and our written stories. So the first thing that we'll be doing by the end of this week is that we're sending out a letter to all of our applicants, 108 projects, with a brand new Dropbox and saying, please share your photos, please share your quotes, drop them in here. Next thing that we have on our table is once we get those, um, I do want to, and kind of to Liza Jane's thoughts, I want to be very deliberate about visual messaging 
and kind of think about how do we do some more videos? So the Oregon Zoo is part of their contribution this year. So they actually donated 20, I was more than I realized once they were said and done, $25,000 towards projects that we funded last round. They basically took our projects we had and helped kind of backfill funding. But as part of that, they've dedicated one video kind of story to each of these projects that they choose to. And I can give you out that list after this call. Um, I don't want to say it publicly just to confirm the Oregon Zoo is ready to release that. But we have about six more projects that are going to get dedicated videos associated with each of them as part of the sponsorship from the Oregon Zoo. On top of that, the department has an interest in doing more video storytelling actually in Eastern Oregon. So I have the green light to pull out some of our favorite projects in that area and to send our videographer there to kind of start thinking about that. Obviously combined with their current workload, capitalizing on where we have them already, but there is an interest and desire to do that. So we kind of have one new outlet for some specific photos and quotes from around the state, in addition to two dedicated kind of um, teams of people to start doing some videos and a timeline, hopefully, to identify and roll that out before April 7th. Charlotte, on, on top of all the things that you do for us, you're three steps ahead of us on thinking about stuff like that, sending a videographer out. So thank you so much for how the thought you put into this and all that you're doing to get our message out. So that's that's a fantastic thing. I appreciate that. Perfect, because I'm three steps behind on your biennial report. So <laughs> I might as well get my kudos somewhere. <laughs> Um, go ahead, Mauricio. Oh, no, no. I was going to make a terribly inappropriate march in Salem uh, remark, and I'm, <laughs> I'm refraining to doing it again. Yeah. Thank you. This is recorded. Um, uh, so along those lines, we have a lot of different things kind of jumping around, um, pulling on resources, pulling on all sorts of different networks that we have. So the ball is rolling and I'm hoping it's going in the right direction. And I think that's where I will be leaning back into this group and our communication subgroup who just got their doodle poll or their when is good poll this afternoon. So let's get you signed up for that and let's keep the momentum for there. Are there any other thoughts or comments about the nature of Oregon proclamation, kind of some of the stuff that we're doing there before I move on? Charlotte, let me just finish with one last observation. I don't know if Sarah is still listening in, but one of the things we had two staff members from ODF and W there at the meeting, um, Amanda, who you've all met, and uh, Antonio, who is that his right? Is that what he goes by, Antonio? Yeah. Um, who is also part of the communications. And one of the things that's clear to me is the OCRF in many ways exemplifies the direction that I think the department is wanting to go in, on a lot of levels. And so I think what we're doing is going to uh, magnify where the department wants to be. So it's, it's a perfect situation where we're doing what our mandate is to assist the department. And I think we're doing it in a unique way that they wouldn't not, they wouldn't necessarily be able to pull off without us. So I think having a good partnership with the staff uh, members is really going to be beneficial. They had a lot of good thoughts, a lot of great input uh, during that meeting. Hey, and speaking of staff and ODFW, so um, kind of moving on, continuing with our communication. So the OCRF has always had two websites. We've had the Oregon is Alive and we've had the ODFW um, websites. And we are still actively kind of figuring out how to use both, how to communicate both, what can we message where. Um, so I know also Mauricio has been very generous with offering to help me update the Oregon is Alive website. I have not taken them up on that yet because my brain's in a thousand one places. Um, and that one in the scope of triage is the lowest. That one is not about to fall apart yet. Um, 
Oregon, the ODFW site was in line of, whoa, need some fixing. So we have had the last month dedicated uh, from our web design team to really kind of dive into that site and kind of shake off the cobwebs, make it actually usable and functionable and understanding. Uh, we're getting very, very close. Uh, so I think with that, I'm gonna try to stop sharing my screen and then I wanna pull up just to show you guys where we're at with that. I am very excited that we have, that's my, So right now you should be seeing my screen. I'm trying to get to. There we are. So are you guys seeing my screen right now? Yes. Yep. Yep. All right. So. Okay. So right now you guys are seeing, this is still in testing, but this is gonna be our new project uh, landing page. So when people ask, what has the OSTRF funded? What are some good examples of what we wanna do? They're gonna be able to go to this new project tab and you will see all of the projects that we have funded based on funding round, how much they received, who received them, click on an individual project, see their website and their, or see their abstract. They will be, once we get our pictures, see a picture of the project. And if they have a completion report right on this bottom is going to be download a completion report. So this is going to be kind of our new, and I'm gonna to go to the another one. Hopefully you guys can still see where I'm at. Yeah, this looks much more intuitive. <laughs> yes, great. that is our goal. So this, and I'm not going to click on it because I don't want to mess up my share, but this is one that's totally done. So thank you, Trout Unlimited, for giving me your completion report. And you'll be able to click here and see what happened in the project. So this is about two thirds of the way through. So you will see that this will go live. Uh, we are crossing our fingers in the next two weeks. Um, and this will be kind of our goal. Of, we'll keep updating as we get more projects, as we get more completion reports, as we get some pictures. And that is going to be fully integrated kind of into the Oregon as Alive. And we're going to, once this is done, kind of start doing that cross-reference back and forth. Um, Kelly, I see your hand up. No, I just wanted to say a uh, really great job. And not only is it, I think, more intuitive for others to look at it and see themselves in projects, you know, they can kind of start to see where this is at and see if this is something that they could be doing. But as a grant writer, also, when people have this on their website, it is super informative to really tone in and, and get ours dialed into the right, the right lane, because you can start to see themes, you know, from different funders. So anyway, this is, it seems like it's going to be really good for everyone. So thank you so much for, for your team taking the time to do that. Yeah, and I will be the first to admit, I had nothing to do with it other than dropping cookies off at specific desks begging for time. So this was totally our web designer spending an enormous amount of time and dedication on this, um, which is greatly appreciated. Since this is a little bit of an extended period, I mean, we've started this actually January 1st, I kind of got onto his list to do. Um, in the meantime, we do have a full project list updated on our website, straight land on the home landing page it says look at all of our projects funded and at least has a list of all the project names the organizations and the funding levels to start with so that's kind of our um, triage level as we've been talking about it but um, I think this is going to make a really big difference long term and once the infrastructure is made we can continue to hopefully care and feed it internally and then go from there so are I'm going to go back, hopefully. Apologies, I'm trying to switch between stuff somewhat unsuccessfully on my computer. So hopefully at this time you are seeing my um, list. Is that correct? Okay, I see some yep. nodding. Perfect. 
Yeah. So, and currently you will see on our website, we do have these two big green buttons where you can at least see the last round of funding with all the abstracts and you can see our full project funding. And then as soon as that goes live, you're gonna have another tab right across the top that says, see our projects. Then once we do that, I'm gonna continue to go through this website with our web designer and build out a grantee website page and a you want to be an applicant page. So kind of separating out information for once you have your funding, what to expect, and then how do you apply for your funding more clearly. Uh, Liza Jane. Thank you, Charlotte. Is, is this the place or where is the place that we ask, that we um, let people know they're invited to donate to support the OCRF? So that's a great question. Um, my understanding is that on our department hosted sites, we cannot, it's kind of, we have to be very careful about how we ask them to donate. What we usually do is learn more about how to support and then send them over to the Oregon as a live website. So the department has two ways of receiving funds for donation. The primary one has always been the Oregon is Alive. That one is where it's much more user-friendly in many realms to go in and donate, learn about what you donate for and stuff like that. We also do have the ELS, which is the Electronic Licensing Service. And um, I am working with our web designers and our information and tech, um, information education team to figure out like, how do we better link people to our ELS? And what is kind of that line of, hey, donate to us appropriately for the government versus kind of not appropriately. Um, the, or, the Oregon Conservation Stamp is kind of the best analogy that I have, um, kind of to try to figure out where that line is. But short answer is yes, we do have a button at the bottom that says learn more how you support and currently it shoves you over to the Oregon is Alive website. Thank you. Um, one more comment that I've been a couple months wanting to make, and it's just an idea. I don't really know where it fits or if it fits, but it's along the lines of um, of I, maybe recruiting or motivating or including people in um, joining us with our values for wildlife and fish in Oregon and our landscapes. Um, and something I believe is that um, uh, stories, having stories are the way we create social change and engage people. And personally, I think old people have some of the best stories and we have access to that, to the pioneer. I get to be a pioneer with my license this year. Um, so we have this huge list of people who have spent time in Oregon um, hunting, fishing, hiking, recreating um, for their lifetime. And it seems like there would be some incredible stories of how it used to be. And, and those can inspire people to want those things again, because we get inundated with what, what a wreck we're headed towards. And it's, you know, just like an impossible world. And if, if we heard stories about not too long ago how things were, it makes it more seem more possible that we can work to create that again and turn things around. So um, any chance we get to include um, elders of all, all cultures telling stories, um, I think it would really um, uh, motivate folks that maybe didn't know what was possible. Um, and I, I don't want to add work. I just want to keep that out there as maybe a possible ability. No, I love it. And it's definitely good ideas are always welcome. And it's definitely not about work. It's about collecting good ideas and making sure that we do our work most effectively with the best of what we want to do. Thank um, you, Charlotte. But I think that's kind of cool. I mean, I there's many ways we could take that. And I think that would be one of those um, kind of interesting nuggets we bring to the communication subgroup and think about how would we do that? How do we want to do that? I mean, off the top of our heads, the easiest list to do that is 
um, the electronic licensing service of those who donate, I can see what type of tags they have. And they also clearly link, um, I'm happy to be contacted. So there's a way to kind of parse out that. Also sent several of our project um, projects have utilized um, different groups of volunteers and different demographics of volunteers. I'm thinking more just age-wise, at least in this example. So there's many ways to weave that into some of our stories. I think that, uh, let's see what's next. Oh, okay. So is there anything, um, just checking my notes. Uh, so yep, so website updates are there. Um, definitely all the information and kind of conversations we're having here is gonna be fed into the um, communication subgroup. Definitely need to kind of revisit our Oregon is Alive website. And also um, I'm getting some help kind of revisioning and rethinking how to use our social media. Uh, you might've hired the worst person on the face of the earth for social media, unless you wanna learn how to use this piece of sandpaper, because that's all I do my social media with. So house rentals, I'm good with. Um, Storytelling, not so much, but I have reached out to our social media experts here and kind of the subgroup have identified the ability to leverage and to amplify and to use kind of stories and concepts we come up with together and to use their networks as trusted partners in the community to bring those out. So we are still working on social media. I will self-admit I do avoid it um, unless you really do want to learn construction, then I'm cool. But otherwise, um, I do want to do one last thing in the communications bucket, and that is to have a conversation about kind of where we're at with our biennial report and where we're at with this kind of ongoing need to get at least some printed and digital material out to tell our story right away. So I sent out kind of this concept of a one pager, and this was kind of our first crack at what do we have to get out the door? today. And what we had to get out the door in my kind of synthesis from the last meeting is we got to tell our story. People need to know who we are in a way that it's generic enough that it can be used in multiple audiences till we hone in those messages very clearly for our targeted audiences. Um, and this is very, very, very draft. It might not look it because I'm a little kind of, I had fun with my InDesign once I got my license back, but um, Everything on this page, other than obviously changing people's voices, which is the stories in there, um, can be changed, edited, colors, design, phrasing. Marit and I started the meeting kind of talking about like some of the phrasing didn't really um, maybe resonate with her or she had wanted to kind of talk about. So I would love to maybe talk through what I heard from the last meeting then maybe open up the conversation to how do we make sure that this is what we would want as our first kind of go around for communication. This has not been distributed out to anyone other than the meeting materials. And just to be clear, that would be obviously to you as advisory committee members on our website because it is a printed material in draft form to discuss and then obviously in this recording. Um, so kind of where I was at is I really wanted to kind of get front and center like what are we and what are we trying to do in simplest language, which I think we can still get a little simpler. Kind of some fun numbers that might be interesting and be conversational starters. A way to learn more, but stressing the fact that we're part of the Oregon Conservation Strategy. And then really to highlight some stories. I picked some of my personal favorites that showed the diversity of what we do and asked these individuals if they would be comfortable and willing with sharing a story about their project and about what the project meant for them, and then a photo. So all of these are quotes from the actual projects with their permission. Um, in this draft form, they still are going to kind of be able to, same as you guys, um, say, is this still resonating? Did they want to change it? How does this kind of fit? Um, and then really, this is kind of the teaser document. We are going to need to do a couple more kind of clunkier versions of project lists and budget breakdowns and stuff like that to be submit to the Oregon legislature, but there is no due date to that. So we just need to get it in in the next couple months so that it's timely. 
But with that, I do see my chat exploding. So I'm going to pause and see if Mauricio, if you, or actually Moret, if you'd like to start the conversation. Um, no, I thought it was great. My only question was at the very first paragraph, it talks about right under Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund at the top of the page, it talks about wildlife associated recreation. And I just never heard that before sort of put like that. And I wondered if that's what we are doing. I mean, understanding that everything is habitat and you know, nature associated recreation would feel a little differently. I don't want to wordsmith here, but I just wondered if that's really true. Is it really wildlife associated recreation or is it all recreation that's sustainable? And we are here to wordsmith. So please do not feel that you can't do that. So maybe I'd love to maybe hear what others thought. Maybe we, instead of wildlife associated, maybe we do want to be place that with sustainable recreation. Does that sound? I think that sounds better. I mean, right now it looks like wildlife watching to me is the same thing as wildlife associated recreation, but I would probably say it's like hunting. If you're doing wildlife watch watching, then that's what the other one would read to me, which is fine if that's what we're doing, but it sounds more like it's sustainable recreation since this is a recreation fund. I'm, I'm not clear what sustainable recreation means though. I mean, that seems kind of big. It does seem big, but I feel like even in that last, oh wait, that was a rack meeting. I'm like, well, this is, um, but to me, it feels like, you know, if people are looking at building trails to do wildlife or biking or something that they're thinking about that in a way that it's not going to be interacting with water quality, like that we're having that lens while we're looking at it too. Not just saying, go build a bunch of trails. I mean, that's what it means to me, but obviously that's probably something else. I mean, it, it, Mark, it means something to me coming from the Forest Service. We talked about sustainable recreation. I mean, it includes, yeah, what Kelly said. I mean, thinking about habitat, thinking about future maintenance. You know, the Forest Service isn't building a lot of things because they don't have any money to maintain what they already have. Um, so things like that. And then, you know, just impact on drawing more people to a certain area, that kind of stuff. So I feel... I agree with all of those thoughts. I, I'm just sort of trying to process them. My own mind is, uh, you know, jet skiing on the Willamette River. I mean, why is that not sustainable? Or is that sustainable? I, I just sustainable doesn't sort of sort out for me, depending on your worldview, what could mean a lot right. of things. Right. How about something like a sustainable nature-based recreation? Nature-based sounds better than wildlife. Wildlife recreation sort of sounds like you're doing it at the expense of the wildlife. I, I think, so my thoughts on this is always, who are we talking to? If we are talking to folks that are already familiar and all this language and all these words have a very peculiar meaning, you are prone to start dissecting, like, does that pertain? Does this is really conveying the things that we want? I'm always advocating for having easy to uh, navigate language, natural language, conversational language, especially if we're talking to a much wider audience. Because then there is really no ambiguity about what it means sustainable, non-sustainable, it, it, one, one particular activity. But if we're talking about just you know around nature, something that could be conveyed, both of those, if that is really what we're hoping to do, that I think that's that's kind of like the direction which I say we could be. Now, that's not to be said. There are audiences of ours that really need that specificity. And I think for that purpose, especially we're talking about funders, especially we're talking about folks that may want to funnel their funding opportunities through us, then then is I think when, when that particular kind of like um, defined accurate lexicon needs to be in play but it also may pertain to a specific opportunities i think if i was to if, if we want to say what is it that we want to do with this document where is it going what is it for we may discover that a lot of the verbosity of it may just be need to be decreased including some of those potential nebul potentially nebulous concepts like is it wild alive associated is it sustainable is it you know nature-based 
it may, may be a non-issue when we're actually trying to imagine that this story, this important set of highlights could actually be three paragraphs with beautiful pictures of animals that people can all go like, ah, and some of the big numbers that is, is explained to us, oh, this is what they're important. This is what they're all about. They're talking about conservation and recreation. And if they really want to dig into the weeds, then you have that QR code that they can go sink in or a website when they can really just, if they have any sort of like uh, uh, need additional clarity, they can go into it. But I think that anything that is, you know, fit, you know, to be face a large audience needs to be, if you were talking to a five-year-old, that rule has never failed me. If a five-year-old gets what we're saying, everybody will get it. So maybe that's a good spot to, I just stopped sharing my screen so that we can maybe, I can actually see all your faces for a second. Um, I do want to pause for a second. So we're running over on this section, but I think this is really important. So I'd like to maybe, Carl, if you're good with that, absorb a little bit of time later in the agenda, which will be flexible and kind of continue this conversation with a two-prong approach. Maybe dialing out, as Marisha just said, and say, what do we want to use this document now as understanding it can evolve? Once this kind of content is started, you can tweak it and move it and play with it. Um, and what is our urgent need and who is the urgent need to and what is the urgent need for? And maybe that is kind of a good spot to think. And then you all have this document, so maybe we can wordsmith offline once we have those things. So for me, I imagine this document most likely in much more of a narrow lens is that as someone who's getting asked by the coalition, hey, we want to tell the OCRF story. So kind of who's going to be using this? My thoughts would be our coalition of partners, our stakeholders, the people who want to help us message our story. Who are they messaging it to? Most likely at this point, it does fall to the funder's bucket making sure that individuals that are out there that are interested in the OCRF, probably most likely our legislature, most likely our large uh, corporations that around this time of year or private foundations around this time of year, as you've seen like the Oregon Zoo and Jane Hartline's foundation, like what, what is the OCRF and what are they supporting? So this is extremely kind of a narrow lens of who's going to use it probably not us right away, probably more of our stakeholders and our coalition. And what is the purpose? This is what the OCRF is. This is what we're doing with your money. Probably would be my first thoughts. And that's very cut and dry. So maybe I'll pause and see. That doesn't mean that this isn't going to evolve, but I want to get us back to that concept of the triage, ever-changing landscape. How do we get our message out in the order we need it. I'm seeing Any blank faces. Liza Jane. Uh, thank you, Charlotte. I don't know if I'm helpful here, but my thoughts on what I saw was once again, very West side focused. Your three projects were all on one side of the state and and they, I understand why they're favorite projects. That's great to include those, but we want to make sure always that when somebody somebody can see themselves. Um, and so, if if we could just change that um, to include a broader picture, I think all our goals will be met with this. Thanks for bringing that perspective, Liza Jane. That's really helpful. And I think visually, so of course I advocate for being, you know, who is it going to? So how, why is it, what would anybody from the coalition would be compelled to share this within their networks? And what I know is that we, every, if anything that reflects upon our own identity, both as an individual, but also as an organization is usually the biggest motivator. So to Liza Jane's point, for instance, using as and you know an, a, a graphic that has the states of Oregon 
and has pinpointed the location of these projects associated with their stories tells a whole lot about, oh, this is not just for the West Side, this is for the whole of Oregon. Having color-coded conservation recreation mix, and that also helps tell the story without having to resource to you know, uh, a paragraph. Perhaps some of those stories have um, intersectional things, you know, it's like these. So all these little bits also allow for those folks, if, if I am say an organization that works like the, the um, Wildlife Defenders, for instance, and I know that there is a project of e either of theirs or within their realm of uh, interest, that is sort of like how we can start customizing, decreasing the complexity of the project, relying on visual cues and visual engagement things. I'm happy to help you with that, by the way, Charlotte. I know that I'm saying a lot, but I'm happy to you know get my hands dirty and make it happen. But I think that is sort of like the, the, the thing that we ought to keep in mind. We are bombarded constantly with things to look at. Right now, we are on the battle of just broadband on people's, you know, and so if you get a PDF that is full of, um, depending on where you are in life, of course, but I would say that generally, if you get something that is just packed with, with, with lettering, you either put it aside because that's something that you care about, or you just, you know, just move right through it. And these are also things that matter to those folks sharing it outward. So if we can provide them with bite-sized pieces that pertain to what they're all about, about us as well, we have the highest likelihood of them sharing them and not having it something that competes with their own communications efforts, but also that does the things that we want to do, which I'm hoping asking, you know, answering your original question is, I feel that this should be about why the OCRF is something that matters to you. The you being the individual, you know, individual donor, donor, but also your organization. This is how the OCRF speaks about what's valuable to you. And there's a lot of things that we can say about that and a lot of stories that tell that story, that, that, that you know, uh, underline that message. Part of the problem I'm hearing is actually we do so many different things it's hard to crystallize it and everyone looks at it from a different lens like for me looking at this i i don't i i'm channeling jane here a little bit i'm not seeing like the wildlife related stuff you know like where's the modus radio tagging study and the ones that are not necessarily recreation based and more uh, focused on wildlife. I mean, that's part of our story, and we we have to make sure we're telling that. So, it's it's a, a very difficult task. And the other thing is, we have multiple audiences. You have this also listen, uh, listed as the outreach to the led or the report to the legislature. It seems like it can't be the same. It can't be the same document. It's because your audiences right. your audiences are different. Right, and we've already kind of identified there's more than one audience outside of the legislature. I mean, if you're writing a document to all the people that have donated to us through the, o o the ODF and W website, that's going to be different than to uh, what you would write necessarily to a coal to the wildlife coalition. Um, it's just it's a different audience, and you would em emphasize different things. So it may be that we're not going to get it all in one document. Right. And I think what I'm what I'm hearing is that this is just a collection of assets. One that could very well be exactly what you have already, Charlotte, that is going to those folks that respond well to that formatting. Others that are more for, you know, broadcasting in social media that are more visual, more, you know, um, that just focuses on one aspect of it. But going back to the what you were just saying, Carl, I think all, all of us, to some degree, know what makes the OCRF unique. And I think that is the real story. The fact that we are trying to bring Jane's uh, voice in is like, you know, we got to speak about the, 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 the species themselves outside of just recreation, for instance. The fact that we're constantly thinking about how to build that balance 
how we bring human, the human sphere, the wildlife sphere, conservation, recreation, all oh, this is this is huge. And this is something that is not, uh, that, that is a story that a bunch of folks are trying to tell about themselves. And we're just facilitating how we have become to some degree their voice as well. So I think, I think the story is there, not necessarily on the specific projects, but we, what we are working hard towards, which is to see what has not been seen yet and to find those moments of intersection which, between those things that in the past may have been contradictory to one another, like sort of like that paradox of like, yes, we can do both. Sometimes because of who we are, we need to focus more on one than the other. And that's okay too. And that's how our portfolio is moving in all these directions. And I can see that in this infographic. Oh, I get it. So I, I feel that that's really what our story is most compelling. It, it, actually, for Charlotte, in reading through your first page, I think you hit many of the highlights that we've talked about. They're in there. It's, it's, you have to dig a little bit, but they, they're there. Where the real thing is like, honestly, is the projects that follow. It may be that the, you can come up with a universal first page, but then depending on your audience, and we've identified three or four right now, you would tailor the projects to whoever your audience was. Like if, if you're gonna send something out to the, um, just to be frank, the ODEF and W website donors, I mean, they're gonna be happy about doing urban stuff in Portland, but they're gonna really be happy if you've done something out in the high desert for uh, mule deer. And so you would pick that one <laughs> to put on the, the communication <laughs> and, and do, and you're doing that in all sincerity because we've done it all, we've done all that. And that's part of the message is that we are, uh, you know, still trying to do it all. And so anyway, that's, we're going over time, but does, it, does this give you something to work with, Charlotte? Yes, absolutely. And I apologize, my eyes are elsewhere because I am jotting notes across my page. I like the idea of kind of, um, I don't know, the switch out of the stories in the back. Um, I definitely really appreciate um, the focus of wanting some more conservation, definitely needing more East Side stories. I am taking Mauricio up on his uh, amazing offer to help me redesign this uh, materials. And we are over on time. So I do want to acknowledge Moret's comment. And then I want to maybe wrap this up with some take homes and next steps for us. I was just going to suggest that, you know, producing all these different newsletters is a lot of work for you. And it's possible that you could also just expand. I mean, I, I know we're trying to stick to two pages here, but maybe there's a four pager and it has a section that's Eastern Oregon, has a section that's coastal, it's got a section that's, you know, recreation or, um, you know, so you break it out into some categories so everybody can see themselves reflected there, including, you know, working with underserved or um, communities are also educational stuff with kids that we've focused a lot of energy on. So thank you, I thought it was good. And I think, you know, it's just a lot of work for you to produce a lot of different versions. It is, I think that, um, I think it's important and I'm already pulling and tapping resources all around to do this. And I think that once we get um, a feel and a template and a focus of kind of where we want, and then the work will become easier as it's kind of plop and kind of play around with what we have and try to make it work as we move forward. So I do wanna maybe wrap this up of, saying you have this PDF, I would really love a serious constructive thought of what is the words, what is the resonation, what resonates with you, what doesn't, and be very open. I'm getting a lot of messages of, I want more pictures, less words. Perfect. The only way we're gonna get where we want is if we're open about where we're not. So please feel free, you are not gonna hurt my feelings. I am a trained lipid chemist, not a graphic designer. So um, I love this space, but I'm learning and I want to learn with you guys. Um, and after doing a dissertation, you ain't going to hurt my feelings. But I do also, I am a numbers person and I do <clears throat> like numbers. So think about if there's 
other, and I'm not the only one. So think about if there's any other ways, including visuals, but also kind of what catches your eye number wise. Is this something that resonates with you or not? Or what would you have liked? So we can kind of do a balance of my learning style and maybe others learning style and kind of with our content and our focus linked to different people. One number, Charlotte, it's 1.4 million, 900,000. <laughs> when I made this, I did not sign my special project papers. So I could not put that number, but I can as of this afternoon. Okay, great. And what I'm referencing is this Trout Creek special project finally cleared my desk this morning. So that is done. That's a big deal. Um, so yes, yeah, so let's kind of continue. Don't we, need, we need to do public comment here pretty quick because we're getting away from exactly. the Exactly. So we are on to public comment. Um, I'm going to officially open that up and invite members of our public and to, oh, Mike, please join us. Apologies for running over on time. Great, thank you. Hey, um, just listening in on your meeting here today, I thought I'd just remind committee members here um, on some history here and, and don't get too discouraged with the, with the governor's recommended budget. So um, if you remember when this program and this committee started, it was supposed to be temporary. It was gonna be like a one-year deal and a lot of conservation groups came together, OHA and, and a bunch of partners, and said, no, this is important. We need to keep this around. And we've been successful there. Um, I think another example, I think um, the Habitat Division Administrator, Sarah Reif, is still on the call here. That Habitat Division and a governor's recommended budget was supposed to be like one or two positions funded through federal funds. And that same group of partners, OHA, RMEF, a bunch of conservation groups and other partners came together and, and helped our legislature understand the value and the importance and the need for that. And we've been successful there. So, so don't get too, too down on, on some of that conversation there. Um, you remember some of the very first funders of, of this program that came from the private side came from hunters and anglers. And we're still here. And we're still going to do that. Every time we buy a hunting license or apply for a controlled hunt, you can't get out of the system without passing that screen that gives you the opportunity as you have your credit card in your hand uh, to continue doing that. So I just I wanted to kind of share those thoughts with folks. Um, if I've got just a minute, I just I, another point here, folks. Um, Thursday at three o'clock. House Bill 2999 is up. OHA is in strong supporting that, well, along with a bunch of other partners there too. Uh, we look at it as kind of a phase two to some legislation that happened in this short session to get some, some money for highway safe, safe wildlife crossings on highways. And this is kind of the next step to that. Another $5 million of general fund. My message for you folks there is, is Rep Helm in designing that wants to funnel that money through OCRF. And, and you should take that as a vote of confidence from the legislature that they understand your program, they understand the good work that you folks are doing there, and that's why they wanna keep funneling money through those things like this coming up. So wanted to offer that. If um, Chair Winter, if I got just a second, I, I got a little project thing also I'd like to share. Go right ahead, Mike. Um, OCRF helped OHA fund one of our big habitat projects where we're planting bitterbrush and sagebrush and doing some seeding in the Valley Falls area in one of the big fire footprints there. Uh, we started that work last fall on a volunteer day. I think it was minus eight or minus nine that morning as I was heading to the project site from, from Lakeview. And we still had over 40 volunteers out there that day planting we're gonna wrap that up on March 25th. And, and I think my point there was, uh, we did a little video of that. We've got tons of pictures of that. And so I would I would just kind of mention before the committee or the agency goes out and tries to hire folks or do something else to get that type of material, you might just solicit the folks who, who have been doing your projects. And a lot of that might be might be available for you already. So appreciate your time. Thanks folks, thanks for all you do. Mike, thank you. Um, I think everyone recognizes what an incredible advocate Oregon Hunters Association has been for the OCRF. Without you, we wouldn't be here. And we really appreciate it and haven't forgotten that. I, I want you to take that home with you. 
Um, it's been a great relationship with you. And we also do recognize that those where those funds that we're getting from the website, who they're coming from, it's hunters and anglers. You know, we we're targeting the other uh, folks that that interact with wildlife in the state, but it's difficult to do what the hunters and anglers have done, and that's actually get them to put money out. And and you guys have done it. So again, we very much know that and appreciate it. And thank you for participating in our meetings like you do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Hi, James. Would you like to share? Yeah, just very briefly, Charlotte. Um, Chair Weiner and Vice Chair Velodrian. My name is James Fraser, and I'm the Oregon Policy Advisor at Trout Unlimited. Uh, I was primarily just joining the call today to listen in on your discussion about budget and the currently open grant solicitation, which I think you're going to do next. So um, thank you for all of that. And uh, I just wanted to come off mute for a second and say that uh, Trout Unlimited staff really appreciate that new quarterly newsletter that Sarah Reif mentioned earlier and just the communication that Charlotte and Sarah provide. Uh, you know, we have half we have a dozen full time staff members in far flung parts of the state. Uh, fixing rivers and restoring fish passage and educating youth about um, just river ecology and trout and salmon and in-stream flows. And uh, it's really helpful for me keeping them all up to speed on your grant solicitations and upcoming opportunities and reporting requirements and things like that. So um, thank you. And uh, I look forward to your next conversation on the agenda. Thank you, James. I just, I just, I'll just use this as time to just point out Trout Unlimited's knocking it out on the park down here in the Klamath with some incredible projects, incredible staff, just doing fantastic stuff. So thank you for that. Thank you. That's very kind. Great. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to share any comments before we move on to our last agenda item? All right, hearing none, um, just to wrap up the last agenda item, um, please provide me any of comments and additional thoughts on what direction you want communications of this to go by the end of this week. And Sarah, although you're not the public, we'd welcome your voice. Not public, but just um, <clears throat> I just wanted to follow up on one of the budget questions, and I didn't want this to be the, the last word. So <laughs> I wanted to sneak it in for your last agenda item because it's not awesome news. So I stand corrected, um, POP 105, the OCRF POP that's in the governor's budget does not authorize additional funds to support the position. So the other funds that it would pull from would indeed be from the OCRF account. And there would have to be funds in that account to support the costs of the position each biennium. So it's not an additional allocation on top of what's available in the fund to, to go back to Carl and Mark's question. Sarah, that was the way I understood it. Um, but again, with this, in the next biennium, it would then be part of the ODF and W budget. The position authority would. The funds to pay for it would depend on whether there were funds available in the account, in the OCRF fund, the same fund that you're pulling your grants from. Even, even going forward in the next, next biennium. I mean, not this upcoming one, but the, so we would always be responsible for funding that position unless something changed in the next biennial budget. Hmm. <clears throat> Let's maybe put a pin on that because that's not good news. Thank you. Didn't Sarah. want to end on that one. Yeah. Um, but I think that's going to be something that will take obviously a lot of discussion with ODFW leadership and internal conversations here. And it's going to be a little bit of a wait and see game. I think I don't want us to dread on that quite yet because it's, a step forward, we have the positional authority, but now we have more planning to do. But maybe we can end on a good note, which is spending our money, which is our new RFP that's out. Um, and maybe wrap it up from there. If you're okay, Carl, you have that thinking look. Okay. So I do want to share my screen one last time and highlight um, our new RFP that's hitting the road. Let's see. Okay, so we released an RFP 
RFP for next round of funding to request for proposals on January 30th. Um, so this RFP is going to be open until March 27th, a little bit longer than normal. Um, and it's going to be set up a little bit differently than normal. And I am going to be holding two different webinars so that our stakeholders know exactly what's going on. Um, we have another, we have a webinar coming up February 17th and another one March 10th. They're going to be the same and they'll be recorded and put on here to this website. So this RFP is going to be kind of focusing um, across the whole realm of what OCRF funds, which is obviously conservation and recreation, but we are really wanting to encourage projects that have a clear drought focus and also really encourage those recreation projects to think about how they have a conservation lens. So kind of those two encouragements, but we still are going to be funding across the whole realm of what OCRF supports. Um, there are specific questions to describe how does your project relate to drought, if it relates to drought. And that's really going to be there to help the advisory committee yourselves really think about how does this fit into those funding buckets. Our largest bucket of funding right now is our drought funding. We do have some other funds which can be used for a wide range of all of our programmatic mission, but encouraging our applicants, think about drought, everything touches drought in the state. So be very thoughtful about that. The other thing that is a little bit new, and I wanna highlight that here is that in light of our ongoing technology issues with our application, we have a kind of a new format we're using. It's a two part application. First, an online questionnaire in an emailed project proposal. And in order for your application to basically be fully submitted, you need to do both of those. So when you email our, your application, you will be reminded to do your questionnaire. And the last part of the questionnaire is, did you send your email application? So they're going to be reminding each other. Um, so the online questionnaire is just basically the project specifics. Um, what is your name? What is your email? What is your project abstract? Stuff like that. The purpose of this online questionnaire really is to collect um, all of the information in a way that is formatted easily into Excel and I as a program manager and you as an advisory committee can sort through your projects more readily. The second part is your um, written proposal. So this is going to be, this time you can submit it as a PDF or Word document. And that basically goes through all of the questions that you used to submit online, but allows you to do it in a more uh, user-friendly format, i.e. whatever word processing software you choose to use. Word counts have been changed. They've been decreased quite a bit, and I've gotten feedback from our applicants. This is actually desired. And also what this is now allowing you to do is to use your space how you want to. If you have a one-page limit for let's say your project overview. You can put photos embedded now. You can give me a table. You can give whatever information visually you want here as long as you're within your one page. You don't get extra attachments, but this allows you to tell your story in the way that's most meaningful. So if you wanna drop a couple photos and describe those photos and that's how you do your project overview, that's your choice now. It gives you those flexibilities. It also allows you to have um, fewer glitches with an online system. So this has been updated um, as of last week. We have an upcoming webinar and there's instructions throughout this document. And I can also send it to you as a, any of our applicants as a Word document so you can type right within it. Just as a reminder, our application um, Requirements are the same. You still need to be a 501c3 or have a fiscal sponsor who is one. Partnerships and outdoor equity are extremely important, the same as they always have been. And the grading for these projects are going to be the same as they have been using that rubric, which is publicly posted. So with that, um, just remind anyone that's interested in applying that it's going to be a little bit different hopefully easier, and I don't have phone calls till 9 p.m. on application day saying your system crashed. So that is what we're trying to avoid. And we are gonna set up a dual system reminder that when you do one part, it tells you to do the other. And when you do one, the other, it tells you to do that. So just as a reminder, there will be a little bit of 
Grace, if something goes super wrong, if an applicant does one part and not another, and I'll have a system set up to remind and to catch those. So it should be pretty hard for you to completely not recognize that it's a two-part system. Moving forward, we are gonna have private forest accord grant system hopefully up and running by the next time we do an RFP. This is just one more Band-Aid in our system. And that new system is going to eliminate a lot of the issues, knock on wood, that we have right now. Um, Mark, did you have a question? Yeah, I think it looks really good. So thanks for setting it up like that. It was just a quick question of, is the advertisement, if you will, for the RFP, does that, has that gone out to all of our previous applicants, you know, awardees as well as applicants? And I guess I'm asking out loud, are, are there other audiences that we should be trying to make sure that the, uh, become aware of the RFP? So that's great. Um, so, so far advertising, um, I've sent it out to all of our past project recipients, all of our coalition members, all of our listed interested parties and gov delivery. I have sent out a press release. I am talking to the Oregon Trails Association. I've talked to the Oregon Conservation Open House. Uh, and I am going to kind of shop around the idea to the Oregon Wildfire Research Consortium that's meeting next week. That said, um, we are going to prep a couple uh, news kind of uh, social media posts for our ODFW platforms that I'm hoping to send out a reminder to our coalition to maybe pick up and amplify. Um, but I'm open to any additional ideas. Maybe the Oregon Wildlife Society and the Oregon chapter of the, I forget what they're called, Fisheries Society. And I think they often have annual meetings in February, which might be a good time to get it posted. Great. As much, I as, am. I, as, much as I hate to suggest it, um, I would send it to Leilani at OWeb, um, and I can give you her, but she tends to send out a lot of um, information about grants and grant making. Um, but I'm only saying I hate it because there's so many people that apply there. So that, that will be a very wide casted net, I would say. And OWEB's actually offered and um, helped amplify our last round as well. So we can totally use them. Um, so I think with that, I want to be mindful of your guys' time. And it is three o'clock on the dot. So I think maybe some take homes and um, some thoughts would be. Uh, let's feel free to email me if you have any networks you want to make sure that I include. Um, and also don't forget, I kind of gave you guys a little bit of homework of send me an email about what type of things you want changed with our outreach. What is your vision? What is your thoughts? And how do we collaborate on that? Um, and sounds like I'm missing a couple recreation groups. So I might be, um, reaching out to you, Kaylin, and see how we can tap a lot of your networks to make sure we get them included. And from that, I'm gonna pass it to Carl to wrap up today's meeting. Sure, so uh, just so Liza Jane uh, mentioned, she'd like to participate in the webinar. So if you could get that information, send that out to everyone as a way to, I think that webinar is a great idea, Charlotte. And I think, Kind of Kelly's sentiment, we're going to end up being uh, buried again in, in applicants. So I, that's not a bad thing. So, um, and Kelly, did you think the changes Charlotte implemented are going to be favorable for the applicants? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love the flexibility of that. Doing online forms for grant writing is really difficult. So this, this will help us out, I think, a lot more. Great. I appreciate it. All right. Well, great. Well, this was a really good meeting. I think um, we got some sobering news, but uh, I'm going to take what Mike Cody has to tell us. Be optimistic moving forward. There opportunities to change the budget situation for us, and and so uh, we within the constraints that we have as uh, members of this committee and our lobbying, etc. I think uh, we can do everything we can to get the information out about uh, who we are and what we're doing and let our work speak for itself. Um, got to engage our coalition. And so we've got some things to do over the next 
several months uh, focused on that. And then we'll be jumping into this RFP. So as usual, we got things to do. And uh, Charlotte, again, appreciate the way you organized all of this. Is there any last comments from anyone? Okay. Well, again, thank you all for participating. Uh, I look forward to meeting with you again and get back to Charlotte on the wordsmithing stuff on the document and um, we'll be in touch. It was, it was a great meeting. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.